thank you all for joining us here today in this virtual space. Um, I hope that everybody is all nice and comfy and cozy and maybe you have some nice beverages or a few snacks by your side. Um, I'm just going to take, <laughs> take a couple of uh, a moments to make a, a few announcements before we begin. Um, this is just a reminder that the Meadows is actually still currently closed to the general public. Um, but we have been working diligently to create some 3D tours so those of you both near and far who are not able to visit in person right now can have some interaction with the current exhibition. So I do invite you to go to the Meadows Museum website and um, under exhibitions you should be able to find the links for the 3D tours. Um, we do have a few more virtual events coming up in the near future. Um, we will have a panel talk with the collaborative artists responsible for the Between the Margins exhibition. And Odette England, who was scheduled to visit us last spring, right before the whole country went into quarantine mode, um, we've rescheduled and she will be joining us to talk about her book, Keeper of the Hearth, um, in November. And there's uh, currently an exhibition on display at the Houston Center for Photography, um, which is all of the work that's included in that book. Um, Incidentally, the day that she'll be speaking is actually Roland Barthes' birthday, and Roland Barthes' uh, book, Camera Lucida, was the inspiration for her project, Keeper of the Hearth. Um, so that'll be, that'll be an interesting and wonderful talk, I'm sure, too. And last but certainly not least, uh, Michelle will be returning with us um, in the end of October to moderate a panel discussion with four really wonderful faculty members here from Centenary College. Um, so I do hope that you guys will tune in for that. All of the dates for every event that I've just mentioned can be found on the Meadows website. Um, and we will also be making announcements on social media um, as details, with details as, as those events approach. Um, so this evening, um, please feel free to ask any questions in either the chat or the Q&A um, option on your webinar uh, Zoom panel. Um, I will be moderating those uh, or monitoring those and then asking those questions to Michelle at the end. So um, not, I mean, Michelle can certainly see them too. <laughs> um, but I'll be the one asking uh, those questions to her. So feel free to just type them in anytime you have a question and I'll be keeping track of them. And so now um, I will go ahead and uh, introduce Michelle and it is my pleasure to, to introduce Michelle tonight. Um, we first met at uh, the Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio, uh, about four years ago or so, um, where she earned her Master's of Fine Arts in Studio Art and Photography. She also holds a Master of Humanities from White State University, and she is currently the Visiting Assistant Professor of Photography at Murray State University in Kentucky. Um, her work's been exhibited in solo and group exhibitions for over 20 years. Um, some of the recent exhibitions include the State of Photography at Georgetown University in Georgetown, Kentucky, um, Art Through the Lens 2019 um, in, at the Weiser Art Center. Did I say that right, Michelle? Uh, I say Weiser. Weiser, okay. Art Center in Paducah, uh, Kentucky, and I am at Marine Art Center in St. Petersburg, Florida, and a horse walks into a bar at the Hampton Gallery, UMass Amherst, Massachusetts. Also, right now, concurrently with this show here at the Meadows, she has another solo show, No Fix Center, at the University of Art at Indiana State University, and that'll be up through November uh, 2020. So Michelle was also a contributing writer for the uh, for From International Cleveland Triennial for Contemporary Art and America City Volume 1. And she is also a 2018 Mildred's Lane Fellow and has been selected by the Great Meadows Foundation to be their supported artist at Residency Unlimited in Brooklyn, New York in 2021. So I know that she's really looking forward to that residency. Um, and so with that, it is my pleasure to turn over the controls to Michelle for her to share her work with you this evening. Welcome, Michelle, and thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us tonight. Thanks so much, Heather. Let me get my uh, screen sharing here. Everything look good? Looks good. Okay. Well, again, thank you, Heather, so much for, and everybody else for taking the time out of your, um, I know, very busy schedules to be here with me tonight. It really means a lot to see so many familiar faces, friends and family. Friends I call family, family I call friends. <laughs> <laughs> and it's certainly been my pleasure to work with Heather in this, uh, in, in this space here at the Meadows. 
Today I'm going to share with you work I've been making um, from 2016 to the present, 2020, beginning with four separate pieces that are also completely enmeshed, both in the process of making them and in, their, in the sense that they deal with four kinds of losses I was working through. This includes pieces that are exhibited here at the Meadows Museum, as well as the work in the show that Heather just mentioned at the University Art Gallery in Terre Haute on Indiana State um, University's campus. Uh, got to do my thing. See if I can get this to move here. There we go. So the first piece is called In Sickness Until Death, which considers the loss of my father and then the loss of my mother in its specific imagery as well as the losses, uh, the loss that you inevitably sign up for when you enter into a long-term partnership. I, this work began when I moved to Columbus, Ohio to go to grad school at the Ohio uh, State University. And this move brought me closer to my parents. My mom had been diagnosed previous to that with a rare autoimmune disorder. And if, in effect, it had the effect of essentially hardening the liver. I feel obligated for some reason to tell everybody this story. My m parents were conservative uh, teetotalers. <laughs> they never drank. And when she found out her liver was gonna harden anyway, she always made the joke that maybe she should have had a few after all. <laughs> but anyway, back to the story, my moving to Columbus brought me closer to my parents and in the actual city where my mother received most of her extensive health care. Um, and I began, so that's when I began documenting her movements through the medical system. And then also by accident, the relationship between her and my dad, uh, marriage of 50 years exactly, and he as her primary support person. And also she is his, I might add. So, uh, some of the images in this body of work are raw, some are blunt, some are mundane as they explore my parents' relationship through this routine of caretaking. The piece consists of three objects. Uh, first, a found love seat, which is orange to match, match a picture from my memory of my mother sitting on an orange love seat in her honeymoon suite. Uh, second, a, a painted coffee table covered with the images from my parents' wedding. And third, a coffee table book, which is actually a com commercially produced um, wedding, or a commercially produced album in the style of a contemporary wedding album. I, I used traditional C prints and I designed the album myself using the images I took over the two year period from 2016 when I moved to Columbus and the fall of 2016 when my mother passed away on October 7th. I'm sorry, 2018. What am I saying? And so the surprise during this time was that my that in May of 2018, my father was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer. And so in early June, we were preparing to have a big party. He wanted to have a what we called a going away party instead of something after he died. He wanted he was he was a social worker and he wanted had he liked the idea of letting people come together and say how much they cared about each other while they were still alive rather than um, while he was laying in the coffin. And so we were preparing for this party, and my mother and I during that time were rear-ended by a distracted driver, which we found out later had fractured her back. So just a side note, the images on this wall, on the wall behind the um, In Sickness Until Death are images of the drive. I lived in Columbus, but and my parents lived about 40 minutes south. And so I would be constantly making the drive back and forth from Columbus to Williamsport, Ohio. And so I often stopped and took pictures of this particular scene or just at some point along the drive if I happened to go a different way. And those are called The Long Road Ahead. So the title of the work is imprinted uh, on the album where the name of the bride and groom usually appear using gold foil um, to reference their 50 years of marriage. My mom was very proud of making it to her golden anniversary. I started the project not at all understanding the intensity and chaos of what lay ahead. And I had this idea, I believed that I was um, documenting and I wanted to align myself with the tradition of documentary photography. So I began the project using my four by five camera to capture images, but quickly realized how impractical that was for this kind of record keeping. And at the same time, I was uh, sort of 
searching through or trying to think about my portrait roots. And I began my photography career as a portrait photographer and studied portraiture for quite a long time. And so I wanted to, so I was thinking maybe I'll, I need to shift to um, thinking about this as portraits. And so I switched to using my Hasselblad. And you can see the images on the right of, the, of this that use the Hasselblad. But just as quickly almost, uh, I realized my mom was going from hospital visit to doctor visit and the medium format camera without the built-in meter just uh, was almost as impractical as the four by five. And so I moved to using my DSLR and made um, several, you might call sessions or re records with that camera. And then, um, but when my dad was diagnosed, um, he really fully embraced his diagnosis and his rapid decline, um, rapidly approaching death. And he declined fairly quickly at the same time, my mom had been prescribed a nursing home visit to heal that fractured back. And so she, she was in a caretaking facility. My father was still living at home alone, but rapidly declining. And so my caretaking duties um, surpassed my role as an artist. And yet, despite that, I, I could not abandon the project. And so I moved to using my cell phone for a majority of the images. Many people uh, think about the work of Larry Salton when they see this, my, my album, but for me, it's actually Nan Golden's Ballad of Sexual Dependency that resonates. Uh, I think this is because I saw an interview and for, that she did for the BBC series on photography. And in that interview, I picked up two things that resonate with me. Her work in that series was about love, family, relationships, and the pain and joy that happens with those connections. And second, she said in that interview that she had walked through many situations that she was afraid of by photographing them. And I imagine that is one thing I was doing myself. So my dad died nine weeks after he was diagnosed. During his final weeks, although he was racked with pain, he would not lay down because he was waiting for my mom to come home from the nursing home to, for everything to be all better. And so here's an image of my sister and I on constant watch because we never knew when he was going to pop up out of the chair or, uh, and start walking, although he didn't really have the capability to do that with the medication. My mom did return home from a back procedure that helped her first back fracture and he died three days later. She then passed away 10 weeks after he did. And so this work tells of one family's story of death, uh, a story of death that was all consuming, exhausting, and shocking, even in its commonness. And I'm thinking here about, you know, what if we shared the stories of death as readily as we share our stories of courtship and wedding day? You may notice that some of my, a lot of my pieces as we go throughout the, sh the talk today have more than one date associated with them, either a range or two dates or uh, something about, um, you know, continuing on. S uh, the grief and of the pending loss of my mother began long before she passed and I was very close with her and her illness and the emotions that surfaced as she declined came sort of as a surprise to me. Um, but so it seems I, you know, in retrospect for me, it seems I spent three years at OSU beginning one new project after another, not fully being able to finish them. And so in this case, the 2017 is when I actually made this work. And this year is the first time that I finished it and presented it. Um, this is the time where I began collecting my menstrual blood as a way to explore the connection between blood, family, motherhood, and my own childlessness. I used the soft cup brand menstrual cups to make paintings using my menstrual blood. And I'm, so I'm gonna share this, a body of work now that used that process. Um, on my website, you'll be able to see them all listed under the title, Beautiful Blood. And within that category, I have broken them down into three different bodies of work called No Fix Center Imprint, and the one I'm gonna to show today, which is Bloodline. So when I, once again, when I began this process, I was very organized and I had this idea that everything was going to be lined up and neat and, and happen in a certain way. 
but it, I, but it was also somewhat detached. So I, I was placing the soft cup, the used soft cups, on a piece of five by five acid free artboard, wrapping them in plastic, labeling them the, with the date, keeping them in my little kit until I could get to the refrigerator. And uh, you know, all who inhabit a menstruating body know nothing stops for your period. And so this kit that I made, that I just showed you was designed to be able to discreetly collect my blood anytime, anywhere. Um, not pictured was the Rachel Ray lunch bag that I carried um, also with an ice pack in it so that I could be even more discreet in any public restroom. So each card was made and then stored, but no progress or finishing of the project at that time. I was taking classes, I was teaching, I was renovating a house, I was saying yes to everything as I do and um, wasn't giving myself time to think about um, the emotional side of what was happening. I didn't have a clear thought about what I was doing or why, but now it seems very clear that the connection between a body that keeps time organically and my lack of control over time, and my lack of control over my mother's health were all factors, as well as the, uh, the subconscious knowledge that I'd be soon losing my mother without having become a mother myself. So and another thing that's interesting to me is that it was, this wasn't planned, but there happens to be one image for every year I have been menstruating. For some reason, I um, come back to these blood circle paintings, as I call them, as reference to portraiture as well, because each seems to be a unique representation that was made with my DNA. This image and a few others in the slideshow were made by the staff at Indiana State University. Um, the other, any of you that you see that are long panoramas like this, I just wanted to pause and acknowledge that. And so at this point, working with my menstrual blood is a significant part of my process. And um, also this connection between having a period as an indicator of being not pregnant. I moved from using this cup as the paintbrush to using my own fingers and um, also became at this time interested in the connection between units of measurement as symbol or fluid, fluidly. Here I'm influenced by the philosophy of Alan Watts, which if you care to hear more about that, I have described under, on my website under the collected one and two story tab. And so here's a picture of my studio at OSU. Um, not pregnant, this body of work is 12 individually framed blood circles uh, floating in the center of a piece of paper. And I do confess that a significant portion of my attachment to is, is just the sheer beauty of the material and how it responds to the various papers I've applied it to. I'm not sure if you can see this um, in the image, how the paper sort of buckles as the moisture interacts with it. So each attempt at making a cir cir circle <laughs> resulted in another unique round shape. I've shown this work publicly twice. The first time it was closed off uh, in this back corner of the gallery, accessible but private. Uh, these 12 circles behind glass representing the months that turn into years of remaining not pregnant for me by choice. And here's a wider view of that show. You can see the not pregnant tucked in that back corner behind um, the wall there. And this also leads to the next body of work where I was thinking more directly about my decision not to have children. Uh, while I show you these stories, uh, I, or sorry, while I show you these images, I'm gonna read an abbreviated version of the narrative I wrote to accompany this piece. When I turned 18, a week after I graduated from high school, my maternal grandmother bought me a hope chest made of cherry wood. My mother filled it with all of the things a wife would need to set up her household. As time passed without marriage, this particular kind of hope was set aside. The glasses and plates and napkins and silverware were taken from the chest and put to practical use. I filled the simple, sturdy chest with sentimental possessions from my childhood and family history. I saved them for a future child of mine. My favorite stuffed animals, the soft cover book Aunt Jan sewed for each of her nieces and nephews in anticipation of each of our future families. The white dress my great grandmother sewed for my grandmother to wear when she was a baby, all were saved in my cherry hope chest. I assumed the children I would have someday would want to see the things from my childhood to learn about my younger self and their family members long past through these objects. A few years after we were married, my husband realized he did not want to have children. 
I agreed in anticipation of all the freedom, financial, bodily, temporal, I could have living a life without dependence. And so after many years, I gave my keepsakes to, the nieces, to my nieces and the children of my friends. Time passed. These children outgrew my sentimental things, and so their mothers returned my objects back to me. My gifts came back to me at the same time my, mother, my mother's health began to noticeably decline. Perhaps it was understanding that my life would soon be void of this, my first and deepest connection, that makes it increasingly difficult to imagine a life without creating the particular kind of family in which I was raised. A family that includes children is the life I was taught. It is how my family measures wealth. But the sense of loss I feel is greater than a certain kind of riches. It is the loss of the mother-daughter relationship that holds me in a state of suspension between wanting to experience this kind of relationship from the side of motherhood and wanting to remain free from the responsibility of it. Here, the, so the first time I uh, presented this work, it was here at this Hopkins Hall Gallery. And I just remembered while talking to you guys that this was the last show my parents saw of mine. Um, and I printed the images very large, larger than life, 44 inch prints. And um, I, had, I started photographing these because I had read that in order to let go of something that you've been holding on to, one idea is that you can photograph them, allowing the photograph to stand in for the object and bring back the memories of the object. But time passed and I was given the opportunity to show this work again at Murray State where I'm teaching now. And I, I realized while looking through my work and deciding what to put up that taking the pictures of the objects didn't work, so to speak. It didn't, it wasn't the objects I was holding on to emotionally. And so um, I took them off the wall and crumpled them up. And, but these crumpled up pictures are not an expression of throwing away the objects in the picture or of my attachment to them or to motherhood. Rather, I'm throwing away the pictures themselves, the photographs, as they did not satiate my desire to be a mother. So I'm exploring my emotions through each different installation of this work. And I'm thinking about my relationship with my body as a potential vessel for childbearing, my deep attachment to motherhood because of my relationship with my mother. Uh, as time pass, as time continues to pass, I no longer see these images as larger than life. Instead, I'm you know, just secure in the knowledge that I'm no way satiated by photographs, but um, my my current and and then here at the meadows is my current iteration of this body of work where i've brought them down to size and you know more typical portrait size and allow them to float which is how i had always envisioned them i'm thinking about are, are these the things of of a dream or a memory of the living or the dead the future or the past the photographs that uh, make up this body of work are floating in a location that the viewer is unable to ground, suspended in space without tether, the same place they occupy in my mind. And here they, here at the Meadows, they're installed for the um, first time with pieces from my family history and more blood circle paintings, as well as a book that you can see in this image in the back left corner of the gallery. Um, here's a detail of the platform you saw in the front of that last picture. I'm thinking about how much of my own deep, long and deep family history, uh, we can trace some parts of my history um, over 10 centuries, actually. And um, how much of this history plays a part in the general social obligation I feel to have a family as well, and equally so in my deep desire to physically have children. I continue to use my blood circles um, here on translucent paper as an indicator of time childlessness and family ties. The book that um, was in the back corner there um, was made as a companion piece to tell the story of the family history. That, that story that I read is an abbreviated version of it, but it also includes some family stories about the women in my family and different, um, different stories of their motherhood. As with many pieces of mine, the idea evolves over a long period of time. The week, the week my mom and I were rear-ended, which ended with that party I was talking about for my dad, um, the very next day I left to go to a week-long residency um, where we dealt with art and nature. My dad had a very, you know, in my family, it's like the idea of keep living your life. And so I, I reluctantly um, went on this re to this residency. 
um, I'll just also say right here that I, I have an attachment to using the color blue in my work as an, as an indication of atmosphere perspective. Usually I do that through cyanotype. Um, and if you're interested in this idea at all, Rebecca Solent's A Field Guide to Getting Lost um, is a brilliant book that really influenced me. She wrote in this book and published in words what I have always felt deeply but couldn't really find a way to articulate. Additionally, this part of my process is also influenced by uh, Walter Benjamin's work of the age of the um, work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction, where he references atmospheric perspective and how things look much different from a distance. And so, at that residency, it's called Mildred's Lane. We were working with indigo dye, and I asked if I could dunk my entire sketchbook, which was blank. And I was granted permission to do this, but not until the end of the week. And so I dunked it and then carried home a soaking wet book in a plastic bag. And I left it on my windowsill and uh, wondered for uh, two years, I think, or a year, I guess, what I could do with it. Um, and so the more time that passed without me doing something, the more precious this book became because it had this connection to my mother, who, because I found out that her back was fractured while I was there at uh, Mildred's Lane. So I'd, I'd love to read you some of those stories, but I don't feel we have time for that right now. And uh, I think, you know, the next iteration of this work, I believe is going to include everything that I have included here at the Meadows, but also some print media as I feel like sort of the outside influences are also pretty interesting in terms of thinking of um, the body and childhood or child like motherhood. So I want to share with you the next um, the next work is an, is one that's in progress. I began making these images in 2017, and I really I can't tell you when I think they will be finished. Um, I began making the pieces in this body of work as I was feeling these excessive losses I've just been talking about, and I began to also study the way in, in which I felt lost in terms of my own body. Now each of the pieces in this work has a different aesthetic. I'm thinking about my body from a medical standpoint, worthy of research, worthy of care. Um, here are three photograms that I made on color paper of my menstrual uh, cup. And I think these are the ones that I have here at the Meadows. It reminded me of a Petri dish. So the title references the seeming fear and myth associated with menstruation, both historically and in contemporary political circles and also a historic misunderstanding of the female body in the medical community. A classic, class, classic example of this, of course, is the many unnecessary hysterectomies um, performed in an attempt to subdue the, quote, hysterical woman. And this shameful history of, uh, you know, another example we can think of right now is the um, shameful history of forced sterilization, which apparently is happening again at the ICE detention centers or even my own experience of endless years, probably 10 or more of not being listened to before I could finally get um, a doctor to approve an MRI to show that in fact I did need to repair some tears in my shoulder. So I have two versions of this, of, the, of many of these pieces. And for this one, the titles are different. Um, a small indication, look closer are the original photograms, which are exhibited here. And they include um, act my actual blood on the print. The bigger piece you see here, look closer at safe, is a scanned enlargement, uh, a photograph making it, making it safe for us. In this piece, I uh, rested my, my filled minstrel cup on a piece of that Aspen Free Mount board. And then I had, in the meantime, I had been carrying around some pieces of paper that I had coated with cyanotype. And I had been carrying those around and never figuring out what I wanted to make a print of. And so finally I just processed them, having only basically just exposed by time passing and uh, maybe for six months or more. And then I cut those into small squares and put them on top of the blood, the wet blood. And so they stuck with that and then also used some uh, encaustic on top of it. So once again, I showed two versions of this work. The original one is here in the Meadows Museum and then as well as a scanned enlarged uh, version of those images. I call it Fukuland, meaning fertile land, 
um, throughout this series, I'm exploring my own aging body, yet still menstruating body. So feeling this idea of getting older, but still feeling young. I think of these pieces as um, topographies of unknown lands. Here's the installation at the gallery in Indiana, at the University Art Gallery. And this, this image um, is part of really, really part of that imprint series that I have included here with my Reclaimed Body series. And these images, this is a scanned and enlarged version, but I also have the originals which are um, made by pressing a piece of paper to my menstruating vagina. I kind of view all of these different looking images as short stories in the same book. When I'm thinking about my own body, um, there's a connection with all menstruating bodies and the continued threat of a loss of the ability to protect my body in a country where laws are passed to protect um, for the protection of land, but denying rights to protect certain bodies. I photographed um, my used menstrual cup here while thinking about the so-called pink tax, which taxes products in the same way we have a sin tax on unnecessary um, products like cigarettes and soda. Here's a diptych of um, documenting my recent shoulder surgery that I just uh, referenced and the continued healing process. The image on the right is the one shown here at the Meadows. Here's an image I made in March of 2020 picturing my unshaved legs, a nod to the letting go of the social obligation, as well as a bit of my sense of humor as I have what I think is a funny hair growth pattern where only hair, grow, hair only grows on the bottom half of my legs. <laughs> While my feelings uh, are very, you know, are very intense at this time, I wanted to explore them to find balance, to find humor, to find love and acceptance of my body as it is. This image captures my first gray pubic hair, turning the comical shock of it into a, an aesthetically pleasing landscape of sorts. And here's the view in the meadows of these image, these works. Here's the view of the similar Im, uh, images in the Indiana uh, at Indiana. And the only reason I'm showing you these is so that you notice in the back left of this, there's two images here. These are the ones, these are a couple of the ones that I, when I mentioned that I was using my four by five camera to begin with, these are some of the images that came out of that work. I call these, this pair, uh, my mother as a woman. And I think that they're nice in conversation with my own aging body. But I originally photographed these in thinking that in terms of medical, her, she was diabetic and so I'm always interested in her feet. And she, we had a lot of conversations about if she had to get them cut off because of diabetes, you know, what would she do? And, and the one on the right, I was thinking about her hands as she had um, severe arthritis. Um, but then when I printed them and enlarged them, I really just saw her in these photographs as, uh, you know, still a sexual being in a positive way. Collected is another of my pieces that has evolved over time, over time, you know, this passing of time. It began as one of the two works included in my MFA thesis show. This consisted of a 32 foot light table I built in the shape of a, the lifeline on my right hand using ash lumber from a tree on my maternal family's farm. We cut it down and had it um, processed and I was able to make this curve because it was still green wood, still wet. Uh, on the light table, I layered over 400 pieces of tracing paper, one for each menstrual cycle I had um, to the date of the exhibition, each painted with a single um, technically round shape, uh, you know, we can say circle, but a circle, um, the definition of a circle is technically that there's a fixed center point in the middle and here there's no fixed center. The circle was made once again uh, using my own menstrual blood as paint and my finger as a paintbrush and this time I was using tracing paper. This traditionally taboo material was used here as an expression of my organic clock. My body is a keeper of time that served to tether me to the present in a time of chaos. The waves made in the paper by the water evaporating as it dries refers to this idea of rippling time over linear time and also the dying body, something I witnessed, you know, the water, how the water leaves a dying body. 
something I witnessed firsthand um, twice over a 10 week period. The narrative that accompanied this work took the form of a poem that I wrote expressing the four kinds of losses I was dealing with at the time and these past four works that I just showed you. So I can read you that poem now. Morning, 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 morning. My father's sickness and death, the sickness and death of my mother, the loss of the children I will not birth and the passing of my youth. Looking to study words unspoken, actions not taken, and time that has already passed. My thoughts circle with each cycle. Collecting time to recollect, meditate, dissolve the mystery, curve the wall, let space in, and grasp the months just passed. To gather, to hold, to let go of the years that are not coming back. My body keeps time with blood and it does not apologize. It comes without permission or consideration, this biological rhythm, a lifeline in my grief, and I want you to see it. And here's the installation view at the urban art space in Columbus, Ohio. And this leads us to our next, um, my next body of work that you can see on the back wall there called Early Winter. I mentioned earlier that I took a drive from my parents' house to my house repeatedly while I was helping to take care of them. The images in this series are a row of over 100 ash trees that I saw on that trip, broken into 24 portraits, um, 12 are pictured here. As I scroll through these images, I'll read the narrative that accompanied this work when I show it. In 2002, scientists identified the emerald ash borer, EAB, as the cause of the decimation of the North American Fraxis, commonly known as the ash tree. EAB is an insect that feeds on the ash leaves and then lays its eggs in the crevices of the bark. The tree dies as the larvae mature and chew into the phelum, destroying the ability of the ash tree to transport nutrients from the, its canopy to the roots and water from the roots to its canopy. In 2013, my mom discovered that she had been living with a rare autoimmune disorder that caused her liver to harden, slowly preventing it from doing its important job of regulating sugars, eliminating toxins, and covering um, converting her nutrients into usable substances for her body. Over the next six years, she lost 100 pounds as her body succumbed to malnutrition. Her decline hastened over the summer of 2018 when her back was fractured in a car accident days after learning her husband of 50 years had stage four pancreatic cancer. My dad died in July, my mom in October of 2018. Increasingly intense caretaking became the new norm for myself and my siblings, followed by funeral arrangements, legal matters, sorting a home and a lifetime of belongings, and finally selling an empty house. Daily drives from my home to theirs became weekly then monthly trips. Each journey taking me past this row of over 150 ash trees, long dead, yet upright, no longer living, but still observable. I'm comforted by their presence, by this visual record of death existing so elegantly among life. Is it really possible to die before our time, or is it just that we sometimes die before the living are ready to let us go? I was not ready to let them go. These images were made during the first snowfall of winter 2018 to 19, and as I mentioned, made up the second part of my MFA thesis exhibition. Uh, At the Meadows is the first time I've had the opportunity to show the full 24 pieces that um, are part, are, that can make up this body of work. I don't mind showing them in 12s, however, as a reference to months or hours, but the 24, not only, it was originally the reference to hours, but um, now moving through the grief process, I realize how important that second year is as well. It's a significant um, part of the grieving process. As time passed, my feelings of nearly drowning in sorrow and loss have shifted. And so I made a new version of Collected to represent this shift. Um, the, the four separate griefs now with their own space. Uh, yet each still attached to one another from a certain angle, but colliding with each other from another angle. Using more wood from that same tree um, that I made the first version of Collected with from my family's farm, this time dried, unbendable. I made the four six foot by 14 inch light tables. I've continued, um, I have continued attempting 
um, to make freehand circles for years, uh, which is an impossible task for me as the creation of a perfect circle is dependent on that fixed point in the center. Without the center, a round shape can be achieved, but not a perfect circle. Circles are closed, offering both protection and space inside. Um, within that circle, there's stillness and a place to rest. The round shape um, is permeable. It has leaks and it's messy when it bleeds. As I negotiate uh, the world of systems that feel increasingly chaotic, a nuclear family abruptly absent its beloved parents in a body that is possibly half, it, half past its halfway point, I find myself exploring life with no fixed center. And so now, uh, just moving on to some more recent work, uh, I made Too Sad for Society and the next body, Morphine Dreams, um, maybe thinking of, about wanting to abstract all of this heavy emotion a little bit or talk about, talk, still continue to talk about the medical institution, sickness and death, but maybe breaking away a little bit from my own personal stories. But still connected to them as, you know, materially. Uh, among a lifetime of possessions found in my parents' house was what seemed like a lifetime of prescription medication. My parents very much wanted to die at home, so we chose hospice for both of them. Hospice shifts end of life focus from the treatment of the illness to patient comfort, which is a pleasant way of saying that patients get any amount of pain medication they need or want. But as I, oh, I'm, the, the chemogram process, I'll just say here, involves painting a relief um, onto silver paper or black and white photographic paper and moving it between fixer and developer to create these abstract works with unpredictable patterns and colors. For this series, I've used um, baby oil spe specifically and the prescription medication left in my parents' house to form them. Too, that, that series, Too Sad for Society, led me to make even more. Um, and this one I called Morphine Dreams, and these are the ones that are pictured here or are exhibiting here at the Meadows. So continuing to deal with grief, using the chemogram process to abstract the intensity of this emotion. But my parents were, as I mentioned earlier, fairly conservative teetotalers had not experienced opiates before. And so this uh, provided a bit of comic relief for us, their caretakers, as their dreams and conversations became increasingly obscure. For this work, the title of each piece is a dream, a musing, or a random conversation that I had with my mom or dad in their final days. These days when they were feeling no pain. This one to me is funny because my dad, a very religious man, had developed ringworm on his feet as a side effect of the cancer. And he made this statement um, while my sister rubbed the ringworm ointment on his feet. He said, uh, Mary anointed Jesus with the same oil. And so here are, here's the, how those look um, here at the Meadows. And the final piece um, I'll show you tonight, making its debut in Indiana, is called Medicare for All. And this is a cyanotype photograms using the medicine, once again, the same medication. Um, and I printed those on medical statements and left at my parents' house. So when making this piece, it's a, it's a eight feet by eight feet uh, circle. And while I was making this, I, I was wondering how, I was thinking about like, how could I justify something so aesthetically pleasing when the topic was medical expenses, which is a topic that most people do not find pleasing at all. And I realized that both, m both of my parents were on Medicare, they were older. And also at the same time, one of my greatest privileges in life was being raised in a family that had essentially government health insurance. My dad, a social worker, he worked for a county agency and so our medical expenses growing up were almost nothing. Our prescriptions were nothing. And when both of my parents passed, then after, even after all of the hospital stays, ambulance rides, multiple procedures, my siblings and I were left with essentially no medical expenses. And you know that's just some that's a that's the kind of life that I um, would like to promote for everyone. And so just to finish up with the views of the gallery. 
here at the Meadows. And um, of course, I'm happy to take any questions with any time we have left. Okay. Uh, let me go ahead and turn my camera on then. <laughs> yeah, sorry, that was a fast ending. I just wrapped it up quick because I saw we were getting a little long. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, can you can you see the Q and A, or do you need me to read that? I need you to read them. I'm sorry, I can't see it. That's totally fine. Um, uh, is it Mila? My, I think it's Mil Mila uh, Reddick. <laughs> she says she asks. All of your works are informed by the passage of time. Do you have any sense of how your ongoing projects will evolve over time or how much uncertainty uh, you want to leave as space for your future self to explore? Yay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I, I pronounced it right. She's just confirmed. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's nice to, to comment. Um, thanks for the question. I, I only have an idea about the suspended work. I'm definitely thinking in terms of collage for that and in terms of including all of the facets. It, some of the things are so deep within me that I don't know, I have to actually do things and present them before I can figure out what I need to do next. And so I realized that the Meadows, um, I do, I'm, it, I, you know, of course I'm happy with the installation, but there, the one piece that's missing for me is the, is the inf all of the information that we receive, that people with menstruating bodies receive about their own body, about what they should do with it, and in, in terms of pregnancy. And so I have an idea what direction I'm heading with that one. But for the most part, um, I, and I guess I will also say that previous to the passing and sicknesses of my parents and the intense time during graduate school that I had, my work was more focused or like in general my work is focused or my thought processes have to do with the intersections of social institutions and the body and so i imagine um my work taking you know sort of returning in some way to that and i imagine a continued storytelling aspect but no i don't um i have i feel that i've planned none of my work even in this show, and I, I likely wouldn't begin to do that that I can think of. I don't, I don't work in a way of um, thinking of an idea, actualizing that idea, presenting that idea. It's much more circular. I hope that answered the question. <laughs> um, okay, in the, in the meantime, um, we have a quick question from Suzanne. She says, is Medicare for, for all flat? or is it dimensional? Oh, uh, I'm glad you asked that question because it is flat and I, um, I, the, the way I selected, you, like the way I put each of those individual pieces of paper, I intended to make it look dimensional, but it is flat. Okay, good. Um, another question is, do you, from Tracy, is do you continue, uh, consider your process and or practice to be ritualistic? in the sense that it helps relieve or help your, you work through emotional aspects of grief? Let's see. Yes, I guess I would, <laughs> I will say yes, I, it must be. Otherwise, I don't know, I don't, um, you know, some of the other things in the past that I've tried to work on are, you, you know, actually before the Me Too movement came up, I had uh, conversations with um, a, a professor where I was say, where I was trying to work on sexual assault and I said the thing that stops me is that I, I keep thinking like you know my story isn't that particular because everybody almost everybody's had this this ex some some experience like this and she said oh don't say that don't say that and like a year later the Me Too movement broke and I was like yeah that is exactly what people needed to say we all needed to come together but for those for all the work that I tried to make in under that topic sort of dealing with that past of my own, I, I haven't been able to move forward on it for, some, for, for many reasons, I suppose. And, and so I feel like with the gr work about grief, I, it must be helping me deal with this emotion or I wouldn't be able to move forward on it in the same way I couldn't 
for this past uh, works that you'll never see probably, <laughs> but maybe something different in the future. Thank you, Michelle. Um, I have a three-parter from Sarah. Did I get out my paper? <laughs> <laughs> if you could go back in time and do anything differently, would you? If so, what would you change? Also, who do you want these projects to reach the most and what do you hope they take away from it? Well, if you're asking in my life if I've ever wanted to do something different, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not sure if you're asking that or if you are thinking about changing my actual work. But um, with changing my work, I, I would say uh, probably not because I learn a lot from mistakes and failure and I really, it's a huge part of my process. Almost every part of my life has been, um, has been learning through experience and the experiences never go well the first time and I think that's fine. Uh, I, I'm embracing that the further I get on into life. And, but, you know, as far as like, would I change anything in my life in the past and kind of um, coming on to that question of who would I like it to my work to reach? Um, I, you know, the, the things that I, that I think of automatically are um, just, you know, like earlier childhood experiences or teenage experiences where things seem so important and they're really, they're really quite not. And I think I might be thinking of that because I recently found my 16 year old diary, <laughs> which was uh, pretty funny to read. And I'm thinking like, oh my goodness, why are these things so important? And Heather, would you mind repeating the third part of that question? Because I think I have a, a different answer that I'd like to say, but I forgot exactly. Um, the, the third part was also, who do you want these projects to reach the most and what do you hope they take away from it? Okay, I, yeah, I, I did want to respond to that one specifically. I don't know if I, I don't think I think about that when I'm making it because um, it's really impossible to predict. And I spent a lot of time worrying about, especially in grad school, especially earlier in grad school, uh, worrying about what people thought of things that I made. And what's happened when I let go of that and just presented the work in gallery spaces is um, who knows who was going to come up to the work and be moved by it or have something to talk about with me regarding their um, takeaway from it. And that has been a lot more rewarding than trying to predict or sort of like have a dedicated idea about what I think people should take away from my work. I think that's, I mean, I think that's a very wise approach. <laughs> it certainly um, makes makes for a happier me, right? <laughs> yes, as a as a also a studio a practicing studio artist, I would agree with that for sure. Um, I have a question from from Mia saying uh, asking, do you have any advice for a college student who's not studying photography but has a passion for it? Sure, I would say um, don't worry. Uh, ignore the naysayers. I have a lot of students in my classes who are, who have parents or society telling them, uh, you, you know, you need a real job, you need a practical job, you need to be able to um, support yourself. Well, and I know times are always changing and things are different, but um, if, you know, I have supported myself since I was uh, 20 years old with photography, various, various kinds of photography. And so even if you, you know, I, I think that like um, there with our society being image heavy and image, I mean, um, online, you know, everything needs a picture. There's certainly a place for, for photography and kind of those um, areas, but also there's a lot more out there than just being a practicing artist. It is true that very few people actually support themselves by being an art, like a practicing artist and that's all. But if you're willing to, um, you know, have a different job as well and or, you know, there's lots of other ways to support yourself with um, nonprofit organizations, with gallery spaces and, and also aligning, you know, I know one person who has a BFA in photography and he is, he also loves cycling and he works in the cycling industry using his BFA to promote a certain kind of cycling online. You know what I mean? So um, I would say at least get the minor. 
Um, I will also just interject in there too that um, even if if you are not able to um, you know study this at school as a major or a minor, um, there are many opportunities out there, um, other nonprofit art organizations that offer classes and workshops and stuff, and that could be a way for you to um, to to dive in a little deeper and to explore a little bit more and for it to maintain that sense of um, excitement and 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 play and fun too so it's well, yeah and along the and along with with what heather was saying there um you know it's it makes for a well-rounded person to have more than one interest right so even if you're even if your love or your career is something different you learn how to think differently when you're when you're creating and that is always a good companion to whatever else you're doing in life i would agree <laughs> Um, Suzanne has another, well, actually it's a two-part question. Um, she says, you spend lots of your work talking about not having children. Is that a decision you regret? Is regret part of the work? Um, so the, the children aspect is more me thinking about, uh, I don't know if I can answer that, to be honest with you. It's, it's this idea of all of the, like making this one decision and then there's this connection to my parent, my mother specifically. And when my parents were here, I had this, re I had this connection to motherhood through my own mother. But when she passed that connection, or when I realized she was going to pass, that connection I realized would not be there anymore. And, you know, one of the things through having children is like sort of passing on these genetic traits. Um, and I also, want, you know, wouldn't mind saying that this work, you know, because I'm thinking about my own particular family and, um, you know, has a lot to do with childbearing. But of course, there, there's a whole nother topic of, of adoption, right, that's out there. And so the yeah i can't answer whether i have regret or not it's more about the connection with my mother and my own choice not to have children it was a choice yes um okay one last question i think i know we're right at seven here um and while as soon as i ask this question i'm going to hold up the qr code for any centenary students um, you don't need to see my face anyway. But um, Sarah asks, do you have any tips on how to market yourself and your art? Huh, tips on how to market myself and my art. Let's see, I think the best advice I ever got and it has rung true is that um, the best connections are by, by making, um, by fostering relationships with people that you're actually interested in and maintaining long-term relationships with them. And, and then they, people know you and they know your work and they think of you when there's a, a time to promote somebody in their own life. And, and so, um, you know, some people make um, materials and send them out to galleries and it costs a lot of money. And, that certainly can help. And um, I, I still apply to shows that you see on the cafe sites or, you know, different calls for entry. I do all of that. But most of the meaningful connections I've made have been um, to actually foster real relationships with people in the art industry. And that happens um, through all of my, um, my master's, my two master's programs. And, um, and those are, those are sincere lifetime relationships. They're not for the purpose of moving myself up higher in this, in this art world. And, and the, and then it's reciprocal as well. I think that's, I think that's what I would say to that. Okay. And I would also say, of course, the website's very helpful. <laughs> People want to be able to look at your work. It's true. They do. Um, I just want to, there was one comment from Amber and she said, hi, Michelle. Wow. I wish I could be seeing this person, this work in person. <laughs> Thanks, Amber. Um, 
So I just want to, we are now just uh, two minutes after seven and I just want to thank everyone who joined us this evening. Um, and thank you so much, Michelle, for, for sharing, um, sharing your work with us. And yes, I can hold up the QR code again. Um, so just thank you so much for taking time tonight to, to share this with us. And um, if you're not able to come visit, I know it's not quite the same, but please do visit our website and um, check out the 3D tours. It'll give you a little sense of moving around the gallery space. Um, so thank you all tonight for, for showing up. And thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. Mm -hmm.